Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I'm a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Each week, I interview some of the best minds on the planet on the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. Any choice you make in life, you have to know the why behind it before you do it, or at least as best as is possible with the cards you have to read in your hand right then. And if you treat other people that way, then they will likely treat you that way back. And it was just so, so helpful for me in starting to combat some of what has always been my Achilles heel, which is not feeling good enough. So it taught me a lot of valuable lessons about the fact that working for other people was not in fact any more stable or reliable than working for oneself, which was a fable I think that I had been told from the beginning and that there really were no guarantees and that I needed to think about ways that I could design my future more proactively. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. This episode features Dara Brustein. You can find her on Instagram and elsewhere at Dara B. I wanted to have Dara on the show because we are twinsies. Yep, I said it. In the world of lifestyle design, travel, and business, this lady is a businesswoman and a real traveler. If you scroll through her recent posts, you'll see her in Iceland, Bali, Singapore, Cambodia. I mean, she gets around. So who is Dara? She is an author and a founder of two businesses, a payment processing company that spans 38 states and a networking events company which serves 30,000 people. She's also a contributor to Forbes, Entrepreneur, Thrive Global, on networking, entrepreneurship, and she's been featured in over 300 press outlets, including Time Magazine, CNN, Inc. Magazine, The Huffington Post, Fox, you get the idea. So in this conversation, we talk about everything from how she set her business up to fund her passion of travel and how those businesses play to her natural strengths. There's a lot of lessons in that one. Also, we talk about how she incorporates play into her life in the way that she wants to do it. And we also learned a series of questions that she asks her boyfriend and he asks her every month that helps keep their relationship on track. And now Kim and I are doing it and we're loving it. So be sure to take a screenshot of this episode, share it on the socials, and remember to tag me and Dara and let us know what you thought. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation I had with Dara. Dara, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. You know what? I am super excited for this one because we're kind of kindred spirits in the world of lifestyle design, travel, and business. And I don't know how we haven't met each other yet, but uh, but here we are. I cannot wait to dig in. Likewise. So thanks officially for making the time. I know that you have been globetrotting yourself, which we're going to get into in a little bit. And I'm assuming you're back in town, yeah? Yeah, just made it back. <clears throat> and you were where? Greenland? Iceland. Flew over Greenland, but was in Iceland. Oh, amazing. I can't wait to get into this. All right. So there's three areas I'd like to go over with you. The first one is I'd like to talk about your business that funds your lifestyle design. And then I'd like to move into sort of the mechanics of how you set up your travel lifestyle. And then I want to wrap with uh, the play hard section of the show, which for you is going to be super easy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. So let's begin at the beginning. I'd like to start with where you grew up. Can you sort of paint a picture for us of what it was like growing up on a horse farm just outside Philly, let's say ages five to 10? Cool. It was pretty magical, actually. And I think like most kids, you think that your environment is typical. So I didn't know any other way. But growing up on 10 acres with horses and a barn and pasture and a pool and just this magical little land where I could play and create and be creative was so, so much fun. And so I remember constantly having friends over and having sleepovers and playing games outside and just making pretend scenarios and loving everything about it. It just felt so private and just this like great testing grounds to play with your imagination. You know, you think of Philadelphia and you don't think of a horse farm. No, you not know? at all. <laughs> so how far away from Philly were you? 
40 minutes. Okay. So it was, it was considerable enough for you to have, <laughs> to have a horse farm. Okay. Yeah. So let's fast forward just a little bit to when you were around 11 years old, your mom was an entrepreneur. Your dad had a background in the finance world, which sort of, I would assume really set the stage to start some early education on money. So maybe, maybe kind of rich dad, poor dad style. Could you give us some examples of the kinds of lessons that they taught you about saving and earning and investing and giving back at such a young age and, and maybe even how that's informed you, how you look at life and money today? Uh, I look at it so, so differently than I think so many of my peers did. And again, in a way I didn't anticipate was different because I was fortunate to have these really uh, proactive parents teaching me about money, both from their entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial mindsets. But I have one really strong memory of this day. I think I was in sixth grade and we're all sitting around the dinner table. And it was myself, my twin brother, my older brother, my mom and my dad. And my dad said to us, I'm going to give you all a lump sum of money and you're going to invest it into the market. And I need you to first research what you want to invest it in and then pitch it to me and tell me why. And then I'll give you the money and we'll all track it together and see how we all do. And we all laugh about it today because (laughs) all these years later, we look back and see how much each of our decisions was so indicative of our personalities. So my oldest brother, AJ, decided to invest in Disney, Coca-Cola, and Apple. So he was a genius. My (laughs) twin brother decided to invest in Berkshire Hathaway, also a genius. And I decided to invest in some generic mutual fund. (laughs) (laughs) I remember that as just one example of so many where my parents were super intentional about teaching us about money and that it was this thing that could be a tool for us rather than hopefully a stress, but that if we could have money be something that we understood and could really use to our advantage to both give in the world as well as to create freedom of our time, that it would be a huge advantage and taught us you know, a lot of the foundational principles from savings and not spending more than you earn and everything about the responsibility of that to all of the tactics. And then you know, the idea of what happens when you have an, a Roth IRA when you're 18 and you just save for five years at the max, then what happens when that amortizes the time you're 65? And like these were tools that most people were not looking at ever, let alone in their teen years. So I've always felt super fortunate to have that environment around me. And to juxtapose that then with around the time I graduated from college, it was 2006. And I came into a really tricky economic environment. So obviously, as we all know, 2007 and on, the market began to collapse. And it was then that it became really clear to me that the way that I was raised around financial literacy in particular was unique. So I was able to then use those skills to write a kid's book on it because I felt like it was really important to help other people have those lessons too. Okay, we're going to get into a little bit more of that story in a little bit. I want to kind of dig in a little bit because a lot of people who listen to this show have children. And I think that it's, you know, it's a little bit different to get some advice from you because you were the beneficiary of somebody giving you the advice. And now you've got, you know, hindsight's 2020, you're able to see it a little bit differently. So were there some particular practices other than the ones that you mentioned that you know, sort of like colored or painted your childhood? In other words, did you guys like, you know, once a week as a family log into your Schwab account? Like what what did that look like from a tactical standpoint? Or did you go out for ice cream and, you know, did he make you pay for it? Or, you know, were, were there, if you drill down into this a little deeper, were there any lessons there? Absolutely. So one of the practices that my mom instituted was an earning and allowance program where she would multiply the grade that we were in in school. So let's say fourth grade times a set dollar amount. And in order to earn that money, we had a list of chores to do around the house, which was our version of a job at that age. In addition to going to school, they felt like school was your number one job and your chores and anything you wanted to do extra were the rest of your job. So in order to earn that full amount, we had to do all of the chores. And if we didn't, we'd have deductions, just like if you don't show up to work or don't do your job adequately in the real world. So when they did that, they said, this is how you earn, and which was a really simple and straightforward way for us at those ages to understand the value of a dollar and how you earn in the first place. 
And then as a result of making that money, we were then required to save 50% of everything that we made because at the time we didn't have expenses like you would when you're an adult. So it got us all habituated into the idea and the practice of saving and not spending everything that you have as soon as you get it. So we would have two different piggy banks or envelopes or boxes or whatever works for you. And we would put half of it in for spending or short term and half of it in for longer term savings, which created opportunity for my parents to have conversations with us around the difference between a want and a need in the short term and even what a longer term goal might look like. And it allowed us also to have the patience to wait and work towards those things. And then they opened up bank accounts with us so that we could put the money for the longer term savings in that in at different intervals in time as well. And then they also gave us other opportunities to earn money and really encourage that. So they made us little entrepreneurs without us even knowing where... I remember I would make jewelry out of beads in our back porch and they would have friends over and I would try and sell it to them or they would come home from a golf match and offer to have us clean their clubs as an extra chore for some amount of extra money or you know, encourage us to find other ways to earn if we were working towards some sort of goal. So there was just really simple daily practices that we could use. And one thing that they did a great job at was to make a visual reminder for the whole family to share. And it was a big poster board, which is a little out of date now, but it was a visual poster board that we would have in our kitchen, just taped to the fridge with each of the kids' names and the list of the chores across the top. And we would put little sticker stars or something of that nature under each chore when we did them each day. So we could all also have this sense of pride and ownership of we did these things and see where my brothers and I were each tracking, as well as to even have a little bit of a healthy competitive spirit, which was never lacking in my house whatsoever. So what you know, it's different forms of motivation based on what might incentivize each of us individually. So there was so much in what you just said. I tell you what is just incredible for me. And I want to just say it back to you because I want to make sure I got it because I got uh, I have a little uh, three-year-old running around. So fourth grade times laundry, cleaning your room and dishes is 12 bucks to the kid, right? Sure. Yeah. And then you split the 12 bucks 50-50, six bucks goes into short-term spending, whatever you want. And then the other 50% goes into long-term, hang on to it because you're going to need it someday. Exactly. Freaking awesome. Absolutely (laughs) love that. Wow. Okay. Let's fast forward a bit. Let's go to college. You went to Emory in Atlanta, where we both now live. And (laughs) you studied religion and Italian. Why religion and Italian? I definitely didn't attend university with the expectation that those were going to be my majors. I think like many 18-year-olds, when you go to college, you think, what's the most practical thing that I can study? So when I graduate, I can get a job and make money and support myself. And so going in, I thought I'll study fashion. Well, actually, no, that's wrong. I thought I'd study business and photography because I wanted to be a fashion photographer and or have my own business one day and thought that was the practical thing to do. But upon getting to college two things happened. One, I realized there were so many other cool, interesting subjects that I wanted to learn. And I started to create this idea that what if college is just a place to learn to learn and exercise your brain a bit. And then secondarily, I interviewed my father and all of his business compadres. And I said, Hey, if I were to graduate from university with a degree that wasn't in business, would you be interested in hiring me for a job? And they all said, so long as it's not a super specialized role like accounting, then absolutely. We just want to know that you're a creative thinker and can think outside of the box and check certain other boxes. So that gave me the freedom and license to study things that I actually enjoyed. So having already learned French and speaking English natively, I was able to convince my parents that Italian would be the perfect trifecta in working towards a career in fashion, which is how I started my career. And that was me learning how to sell something because, you know, going to Emory, it was a private university and my parents were generous enough to fund my education. So that was my way of making it more practical and palatable for them. And religion simply came up because I have always been deeply curious about people. And when I started to study world religions, I realized, hey, if this is something that I can have some sort of grasp on the breadth of religions then perhaps I'll better understand what makes people tick, how they make decisions, why a lot of current events happen that have any sort of religious attachment, why a lot of things in history occurred. And I just thought it would be a really different and unique underpinning to understand people better, which 
seemed at the time my hypothesis was would be really the foundation for a successful career regardless of what direction I went in. So I'm going to ask you a general question about college. What's your thoughts overall on whether or not people should go to college? Now, I know that not everybody should go to college. And I'm assuming that you would think that you don't want to make a blanket statement and say nobody should go to college. But I have to tell you, you know, I've got a, uh, I'm a chiropractor by trade. So I've got, you know, I've got my four-year degree. I've got my chiropractic degree. You've got your degree. And me and you and a lot of our friends are not quite using it the way we thought we were going to be using it. So was it time well spent? And will you recommend it for, let's say, your kids if you decide to have some? So for fear of getting fired from the board of my university, which I sit on, I will say that I definitely don't think college is for everyone. And I think like any choice you make in life, you have to know the why behind it before you do it, or at least as best as is possible with the cards you have to read in your hand right then. So what I mean by that is for me going in, I knew that I wasn't going to come out with debt and that it was important. It was a value that my parents and I shared was furthering my education. And I looked at it not just as what's the degree and then what's the ROI on that degree, but how do I grow up in this environment? How do I learn? How do I expand my horizons and my network and experience new things in a way that I may not in a different environment? I do think that... you going to a college environment is a pretty unique space. And so for me, all of those things were valuable enough to want to do it. And I don't regret it whatsoever. It was such a formative experience for me. However, I don't think it's for everyone. And if you're going in a way where maybe there's different constraints and the money is a huge issue and coming out with debt might not be worth it, and you know that you want to do something where the degree won't necessarily be the thing that underpins your success in doing so, then it might not be. And frankly, this is a conversation we have on the board all the time when I go to our university's board meetings that what makes the university still relevant in the future anyway? And how do we speak to or justify the raising, raising costs that are way outpacing inflation and other demarcating factors of what people make in the world? to go and spend so much money, not only on tuition, but on all the other costs of living and otherwise that it, that come hand in hand. So, you know, the, the general thesis here is no, it's not for everyone and make sure that you're super clear about why you're doing it in the first place and make sure that why you are or not is in alignment with your values and your why. Yeah. I mean, when you think about, you know, somebody going to NYU and, you know, if they don't have loans or if they don't have uh, parents paying for it and coming out with, you know, a quarter of a million dollars in debt, and all they have is a degree from NYU, and I put all in quotes, I don't know if it's worth it anymore. You know, I just don't know if it's worth it for everybody. It's certainly going to be interesting to see what happens as the labor force changes in general with the change of technology and AI and all these other things that are realistic and they're going to be changing at a pace much more quickly than I think any education platform will be able to keep up in a traditional sense like we've known it. So... We'll see how things evolve, but I agree with you that I think it's going to change dramatically in the way we see the next generations of children looking at college. Yeah, we're in a really unique spot in history. All right. So uh, at around 23, you bought a house. You started working for a fashion company that went under and you got your first taste of what it was like to be an employee and have have a company fold on you. What were the the key lessons learned and how did that shape you as an entrepreneur today? Well, it terrified me at the time. I had always been under the impression that you go to school, you get good grades, you get a job happily ever after. And that that job is there and it is steady and the money that you make from it is what you can count on to survive. So when I bought a house at 23, it was in duress. I I had a restraining order against my landlord and I made the decision that I didn't want to be in that feared position anymore. So I bought a home thinking, okay, I have a stable job and I was doing great at it, but didn't even consider that the company might not be doing well and that I would never be the wiser, which I wasn't. And about a week before Christmas that year, about three months into my mortgage payments, the company went under and there went my paycheck. So it taught me a lot of valuable lessons about the fact that working for other people was not in fact any more stable or reliable than working for oneself, which was a fable I think that I had been told from the beginning and that there really were no guarantees and that I needed to think about ways that I could design my future more proactively. Why a restraining order? (laughs) 
Uh, the real story is that I had a bipolar landlord who took out a lot of his challenges on myself and my roommate because he was not in a great place mentally. So you, so it was literally like you had like a psycho landlord that you had to protect yourself against. Yes. <laughs> okay. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Just trying to get that story because that was, that was an unusual part of the story, but now yeah. it makes sense. All right. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us the story of how your twin brother approached you with the idea to start a credit card company and how that led into a business that's now serving the lifestyle design that you're currently living? Absolutely. So after I lost that first job, I also subsequently lost two more because that was in the deep, deep part of the recession and companies just couldn't afford to keep me or many, many other people. So after three strikes, I realized I've got to figure this out and take the reins into my own hands. So my twin called me, he was living in San Diego at the time. And he said, I want to start a credit card processing company and I want you to partner with me in it. And my initial reaction was to laugh and say, you do know that I just came from the really sexy world of fashion, correct? This sounds exponentially more boring than anything that I could dream up for myself. And he said, well, I'm here if you want to talk about it. And so I thought about it for a while and decided that there was nothing to lose in doing it, but so much to gain. And I realized that I could really readjust the way that I looked at passion. And I used to think it had to be the things that I was overtly or explicitly interested in that I needed to make my career. When in fact, I learned through that experience that you can become passionate about something by using your gifts in ways that maybe you hadn't fathomed before. So through that business, we grew it into 38 states over the course of we've operated it for a little over nine years now with many, many ups and downs. I know this is going to be like one quick soundbite, but I think it's really important for anyone listening to know that I don't take lightly that we grew to that place, that we had tons and tons of challenges and points where we hit zero over and over again with things like embezzlement and other circumstances that were really, really painful and hard to endure. But now as a result, we were fortunate to grow a business that has a residual income. And I think people talk about what seems like a, a far off tale of this idea of residual income or mailbox money. Like you were earlier referenced Robert Kiyosaki, who's someone whose books I read religiously in high school and always set into my mind this idea of how do you make money passively when you're not working? So I was very fortunate to back into kind of accidentally, thanks to my brother, a business where no matter what I'm doing or where I was, money was coming in when our clients were processing credit card transactions. And it became this snowball effect that as we grew and grew, that income became bigger and bigger and created the financial freedom for me to make different choices and have the freedom that I wanted to design my life really, really intentionally. All right. So let's dig into the details there just a little bit. How have you set things up to run so that you don't have to be working the traditional 40 hour per week business? In other words, is this set up in some particular, you know, Tim Ferriss automated muse way, if you understand the reference there? Totally. Uh, so no, it's not. I am just a believer in learning the ropes myself enough to understand how to hand them off to someone else and teach them what they need to know or trust that they already have a lot of the skills and then hand it off to a point where I'm not completely blind to what's going on and I have oversight still, but that they can do you know, maybe 80 to 100% of what I could have done, but it frees me up more and it probably costs me less to have them do it than for me to do it myself because I have more earning potential doing something else that's a higher and better use of my time. So with the credit card processing company, my brother and I first split responsibilities where he was predominantly operations and I was predominantly business development. And then I already knew that that half of the business was handled. And then when it came to my side, a lot of just the nature of the business itself is such that it's passive once someone's set up. So it's really low lift in the front end when you're working with the customer to get them set up. And then once they're set up, it's super, super low. And then just as a standard model of how the business works in general is everything gets outsourced to the back end provider. It's a brokerage model. So if you think of like insurance brokering where you might get set up with Humana or Aetna or United, then those providers take over from there and you become just an additional point of contact. So it, be, it really lightens the load in the first place. There's plenty of weeks now where I work 40 or more hours because I choose to. And then there's plenty of weeks where I don't. Okay. That's what I was going to kind of go into a little bit there, which is how much time are you spending working? How much time are you spending traveling? And how has outsourcing 
you know, been a significant part of both of those. If we get into the weeds a little bit there, are you using an outsourcing company like Upwork or how have you done that? I have really piecemealed things together. So Upwork is a huge resource for sure. And I go there for things that are really specific. So I might say, I need this video edited down or I need this interview transcribed to write it for an article that are to transcribe it into an article that I'm creating. Or I might have some data mining that I need done for some of our customers for one of the companies or through an email list. And I'll go to Upwork with a specific task in mind that way. In other cases, like I have two admins those came through referrals. Like I deeply believe in the power of networks and community. And I think when you're looking for something that's going to be that intertwined into your life on a day-to-day basis, then for me, it felt more natural to just go to my network and say, this is what I'm looking for, kind of create the job description and ask for referrals and recommendations and have had slam dunks as a result of that. All right. So you referenced the word that's associated with your next lifestyle design business, and that is network under 40. What is it? And can you give us an example, maybe better yet, some color on why you started it? Absolutely. So Network Under 40 is an events organization that puts on happy hour style and lunch style events for people under the age of 40 in mid-tier US cities. And we say that it's about friendship first and business second. And it's really about getting millennials in particular offline and into person to build relationships because I deeply believe that life is one, better lived in community, and two, that your goals are much more quickly reached when you do it with other people and when you look at them as true relationships and friendships before transactions or ways to just get you to your goal. So because of that, after graduating from college, a couple years later, a friend moved back to Atlanta from law school and she said, I'm having a really hard time making friends as a young adult Everywhere I go, I'm getting hit on, sold to, or everyone is my parents' age. And she said, do you have anywhere to suggest? And I racked my brain for a bit and I said, you know, growing my credit card processing business, I've gotten really ingrained into a lot of these quote unquote networking organizations in Atlanta, but they all kind of hit on one or more of the things that you are saying are not a fit for you. So I can't really think of a place to send you. So my favorite thing in the world is to connect people. Why don't I just start it for you? So as simply a favor to her, I started the first event about seven years ago. And all I did was tell people, listen, this is a place where it's about friendship before business. Come be who you truly are, have authentic conversation and let it evolve from there. No stress, no pressure. Don't feel like you have to be someone who you're not. And people showed up, about 94 people came to the first event and the energy was electric. And they said, can we do this again? And that just became a snowball where now seven plus years later, we operate it in four cities. We have over 30,000 people in the community and people just really feel like they can connect with this idea of being themselves more authentically and being able to organically evolve a friendship into bigger and better things. That's amazing. What a great story. So, you know, I think most people don't recognize the power of their gifts in business. And for you, the gift you have for connection and networking has really served you well. How would you advise people to deconstruct their, let's call it X factor and apply it to a business? I love that question because I have always struggled with it myself. And I I lament with anyone who feels the same way where perhaps like me, you didn't have a skill that was really celebrated when you were growing up. For example, maybe you weren't the valedictorian or the star athlete or the best singer or artist or whatever the things were that really were taken and applauded when we were younger. And I was definitely one of those people who was okay at a lot of things, but I wasn't exceptional at any one of them. And I really struggled to figure out, well, what is that thing? Like, what should I be really putting all of my energy into? And I later realized, and I think the biggest key to it was really two keys. One was to leverage my community and go to people who knew me really well and whom I trusted and ask them a set of questions to have them mirror back to me what my strengths were and maybe things that I didn't recognize in myself. And as a result of that, I'd see patterns and I could see that the thing that they all said to me was, you are this exceptional connector and convener of people and you see the world like a puzzle that you put together in a way no one else sees it. And to me, that just felt natural because that was my perspective and I saw things like that forever. But I didn't realize that other people really valued it and how much value it was giving to them in exchange. And so for anyone who maybe feels that way, I'd say 
Stop taking for granted the things that come naturally to you because those are probably your gifts and the things that you can build off of. You know, it's incredible. So now you've got these two businesses that are running simultaneously and you're spending a bunch of time traveling. So I want to talk now about the other part of your life, which is travel. And it's rare, honestly, honest to God, it is rare that I get an opportunity to talk to somebody who is really traveling in the way that you're traveling. For example, if I scroll through your recent posts on Instagram, I'm going to see you in Iceland, Bali, Singapore, Cambodia, and that's just to name a few of them. So my first question is, how often do you travel and how often do you want to travel? I love this conversation. I'm smiling hugely because I love to travel. (laughs) I travel 50 to 60% of every month and I want to travel currently 50 to 60% of every month. And that's definitely an amount that I feel comfortable with today. But I'm also hyper aware of the fact that at earlier stages of my career, that looked different. And I would imagine at different points in my life, given other priorities, that that might change again. All right. Let's drill down a bit on the mechanics here with travel. Do you pre-plan your travel for the year or is it more impromptu? Definitely a combination. There's certain pillars that find themselves on my calendar. Like One of my main priorities in life in general is to be at the milestones of the people whom I love. So in my 30s and 20s, like I'm 34, that is often around weddings and baby showers and you know, 30th and 40th birthday parties and things of that nature. So those often take precedent and find themselves on my calendar a year or more in advance and become sort of places where I plan around. So the reason I was just in Southeast Asia, like you were mentioning, was because my cousin lives in Shanghai and she was getting married in Bali. So my partner, Brendan, and I said, okay, let's go do a tour of Southeast Asia to some of the places we haven't spent a lot of time. So we planned around that or, you know, Iceland, we found a really great flight deal and (laughs) just up and went because we hadn't been and wanted to go. So some of it is super spontaneous for the moment. Others, we get last minute invitations to go to maybe retreat somewhere and want to go or, you know, find a great deal or just feel like, hey, we've got some time in the calendar we haven't accounted for. Where should we go? And it's really just a combination of living in flow and seeing what evolves and then planning around the things that we want to make a priority. It's amazing. You know, my, uh, I, I've got travel all around me. I just, these are my people. For example, the guy who uh, will be listening to this interview closer than anybody listening to this interview is my editor. <laughs> and my editor is on a Harley uh, and I think he's taking a year off and he's in another country, it seems, every week, somehow getting his Harley from one location to the other. So I am obsessed in the same way you are. And that's why I opened with, we are um, for sure kindred spirits in this area. Yes. I want to talk a little bit about how you pay for this because that's the next question everybody wants to know. And we we talked about it in the beginning, uh, your two lifestyle businesses, but maybe we can get even more granular and talk about how you set up your play fund to earmark the money for travel. Absolutely. So for one, I think an important foundational thing to talk about is that when I started thinking about what I wanted my life to look like probably about 11 or 12 years ago, I literally wrote it down, like the dream vision of my life with a 10-year lens. And then next to each item, put a dollar value of what's it going to cost to accomplish that. So then I had a number and I said, okay, well, if part of that is travel, and at the time my goal was once a month, which now is funny because it's so different than that. But I said, this is what it's going to cost to live that. So I knew how to structure my businesses and reverse engineer it to say, okay, and I'll just, the number was 120,000 at the time. And I thought, okay, if the life that I really want to live is worth, it costs $120,000, what's it going to take for at the time I had the credit card processing business to get me there? And I knew that the average client was $40 a month in residual revenue. And so how many clients a month would I need to get over what amount of time to get me to about $10,000 a month in revenue? And I was able to back into that and figure out, okay, well, as a result, then what kind of prospecting do I need to do? And what kind of, you know, how many people do I need to be talking to? And you can really plan it out in more of a day-to-day, hour-to-hour way if you so wanted to get to how do you get to that place. And then it actually doesn't feel so far off or so daunting or so overwhelming as it could potentially when you really can plan it out 
that explicitly. So I th- I think that's an important place to start. But so that being the case, I decided to start a play fund because I, having had the upbringing that we talked about, have always really taken pride in savings, like to a point where actually my financial planner said to me one time, stop saving so much money. You don't need to save that much money because I had been raised doing it. So he said, because I know the way your mind works, why don't we set you aside a different budget fund and we'll just call it your play money. And so you can do anything that you would consider a luxury that otherwise you would maybe question yourself for doing. And so for me, that's heavy on travel or other things that I just like to pamper myself with from time to time to enjoy all of the hard work and everything else along with it. So I put aside a certain amount of money every month for play. And then, you know, when a trip comes up, I don't have to think about, well, can I afford this now? Because I know I have this sum of money sitting in a pool off to the side, explicitly reserved for this. So when you take your trips, how... I don't want to use the word frugal because that <laughs> that sounds demeaning. But how frugal are you on your trips? Well, it depends. So again, it kind of comes down to values. Like I value travel and experience way more than most things. And then within travel, the thing that I value the least, which is probably going to be um, a little bit heretical to some people is food. Like I'm not a huge foodie that doesn't matter that much. So that's a place Mm. where I'll cut back on expenses. And I like nice places to stay, but it also really depends what's the nature of the trip. If we're going to be out and adventuring and exploring all the time, I don't spend that much on where we're going to stay. But if it's somewhere where we're going to be relaxing and in the... Airbnb or the hotel with a high amount of frequency, then I'll invest more into that. I am fairly economical when it comes to airfare, although I am way, way too loyal to Delta Airlines, which as another Atlantan, I'm sure you can understand. So Mm -hmm. I often will pay a premium Mm -hmm. for that. But it really varies. I think as a whole, I'd say I know the places that I value spending money. And so I'll put it into the experiences and I'll put it into certain things like that, but I won't necessarily put it into like shopping when I'm traveling or souvenirs or expensive food outings. Yeah. This is the question I get asked a lot. My answer is pretty similar to yours, but it was really interesting to hear your answer because we have different things that we spend money on. So, you know, I am a foodie. I love it. And so I obsess, you know, painstakingly (laughs) over restaurants. Like I, you know, I'm on revision. I'm going this weekend to Barcelona and I'm on like revision six and I'm driving the concierge crazy in the hotel (laughs) because it has to be perfect. But then other things I just don't give a shit about. Do you know what I mean? So it's, so this is, this is the point that I think both of us are making to the listener. And that is if you want to travel, you can reverse engineer how much it's going to cost. It's probably not going to be as much as you think. And then when you get there, if you're going to be doing this, like you are, you know, 50% of the time, you do what you do here, you know, where you live, you pick and choose what you want to spend your money on. You're just doing it there. So I love the advice that you gave. I think it's so important, you know? Thank you. You're welcome. So I also see that you mentioned that there is a significant other in your life. Uh, His name is Brandon. Could you tell me about the questions that you ask each other every month that sort of helps you tune in and get intentional about your relationship. I'm so glad you're asking this because this is such a fundamental foundational element of our success as a couple, I think. And it's something we are so happy to hear when other couples tell us that they've adopted it as a result of us sharing it with them. So basically what I'm talking about is every month on our month anniversary, so to speak, like the day that we met each month, we connect with each other and we have an intentional time to dial in and ask a series of questions that we ask on repeat every month. And the questions are things like, what did I do in the last 30 days that made you feel loved? Or what could I do more of and less of to make you feel more loved? Or things that aren't specific to the relationship but help us just tap into where each other's head is right now. Things like, of what are you most worried, stressed, or anxious about? that's coming up in the next 30 days or what's your goal, hope, or intention for you, me, and us in the next 30 days or of what are you most proud of you, me, and us over the last pre- uh, the previous 30 days. And so it gives us this moment to say, you know, while certainly we've been together over the last month, to really be intentional and tap in and say, 
here's a time where we can get in with some depth and no one's feeling distracted. No one's going to be blindsided. No one's, you know, head isn't in the right space to have this type of conversation. And I think one thing that is really important to point out and a lot of people bring up is, well, is this just like a, what's it called? Like a report card? Or is this a way that you just rail on each other? And to me, that actually tells a lot about the person who's asking in their relationship when really I think it's all about coming in service to the relationship. And when we both do that every month and and, in full transparency, there's plenty of times we come into the conversation and are a little bit nervous feeling like, oh my gosh, what might come out? Is everything okay? But then we always walk away feeling really refreshed and really good and really connected and really grateful for that time together. And and also, it doesn't mean that we don't have these types of conversations in the interim period between each check-in, but it just creates this really great space to grow the relationship. Who initiates the the questions? Or is it just on the calendar and you have a meeting and you go out to dinner? Or what's it look like? Because it's every month. It's 12 times a year. Yeah, it varies because much like you, Rob, our months and days look so different every single day. So while we aim for it to be on the exact day of our month anniversary, it doesn't always work that perfectly, but we are both really committed to touching base with each other and saying, okay, we haven't done our check-in yet. Let's carve out some time. And so often we'll, you know, cook a dinner and, and go over the conversation together or often we'll be on like a road trip when we're traveling somewhere. And that's a really great time, just somewhere where we have some privacy, where we're not distracted to make it a priority. And I'd say we both equally hold ourselves accountable to it and each other. Do you have the questions memorized or do you look at them on a list in your iPhone? We have them on our iPhone. We also decided to buy a little moleskin journal that we keep with us. So anytime we remember to bring it when we're traveling is really nice. So we record the answers on paper or we put them in an Evernote when we don't have the moleskin with us, which is nice because it gives us something to go back to and see you know, what were the things that we were talking about at these different stages? How have we grown or not grown since then, or even in the 30 days between to go back? And then at the end of each session, we have one question that we just call a fun random question that just kind of keeps it light and silly and different. Have you ever heard of Tony Robbins morning questions? No. So I'll give them to you real quick, uh, cause I think you'll dig them. And I think people listening, uh, if they're interested in what you just did, they'll like to hear this too. My wife and I do uh, these questions every day when we take our walk. And the questions are, what am I most happy about in my life right now? And what about that makes me happy? How does that make me feel? What am I most excited about in my life right now? What about that makes excited? How does that make me feel? And the same for the, the same second two questions for each one. What am I most proud of in my life now? What am I most grateful about in my life? What am I enjoying most in my life? And what am I committed to? to most in my life. And then we wrap it with who do I love and who loves me? And how does that make me feel? It's beautiful. And what it does is it creates a reframe of the day when you've got all kinds of shit being thrown at you and you're like, God, I'm so stressed. I have everything going on. When you have a reframe and you focus on what you're happy, excited, proud, grateful, enjoying, committed to, and who loves you, it takes five minutes and it sets the tone for the day. So I am going to add your strategy to these questions, except I'll do that obviously monthly. Mm. So just for the sake of time. And so I can share this with people, would you mind just sending those over to me so I can add it into the show notes? Absolutely. So I want to talk to you a little bit about something that I have no idea about. What is Davos and why were you invited there in your twenties? So Davos is the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. And it's this really highfalutin thing where dignitaries from around the world come together. There's about 1,500 folks from everything from royalty to the executives of every Fortune 100 company and lots of other really impressive people and celebrities show up there. So at the tender age of 27, I think I was, I got invited to go as a result of writing my kid's book. They wanted me to represent on youth financial literacy Not only was I astonished and gobsmacked, but I had this overwhelming sense of why the hell am I being invited here? I am by no means someone who fits under these guidelines or guideposts. And I just had this huge sense of inadequacy and of I'm not good enough and of imposter syndrome. But it was just fascinating because I think like any experience, it's really easy to expect or or assume it's a certain way. And then you go and you realize, oh, hey, they're just like us, like very much like the Us Weekly articles. And so I went in this place and I realized, okay, I'm sitting next to 
like John Legend or Charlize Theron or Bono's CEO or the CEO of Coca-Cola. And I don't say that to name drop at all, but I say it to mean there I was already feeling super insecure. And then I'm having like normal conversations with these folks who are not treating me any differently or otherly. And it was such an important moment for me at this formative stage of my career to realize we are all just people. And if you treat other people that way, then they will likely treat you that way back. And it was just so, so helpful for me in starting to combat some of what has always been my Achilles heel, which is not feeling good enough. Love that. Now I know what Davos is too. That was a win. <laughs> I That's so cool. Okay. So let's do a little check under the hood and move into the play hard part of your life. Most entrepreneurs are super driven type A, hard charging people, and they don't take the time to play. Now, just for definition and context, play hard does not have to be champagne spraying in Saint-Tropez, <laughs> although it can be. Sometimes it's even sexier to sit down and read a book that you've always wanted to read. So if you added more play in your life, what kinds of things would you love to add? I think I'd like to add more physical activity of play. Like some of my favorite ways to do physical activity are things like acro yoga and pole dance and tap dance and things that are a little bit unusual and often take a partner and or some form of equipment. So they're things that I pretty quickly relegate to the lower end of my priority list. So those would be things that I would like to prioritize more into my play. Well, this would have been a video podcast (laughs) if I knew that in the beginning. (laughs) Other than time... What's the biggest block challenge or struggle with adding more play in your life? I think everything for me comes down to priorities. At the end of the day, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people blame busyness. Because to me, busyness just means that something is more of a priority for your time than something else and that that's your choice. So I always relegate physical activities later onto my priority list, no matter how much I enjoy them. And I think really it's about the reframing of why they're important for me so that they get higher up. I love that. If you can spend a month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Oh, that's so hard for me. Um, the first thing I know I'm that's why go I asked with it. the first thing that came to mind, which is South Africa, just because it's been so high on my to do travel list for a while. And everyone says it's the most beautiful place they've ever been. And that once you go, you don't want to leave. So plant me in Cape Town. <laughs> I just got back so I can tell you all about it. Oh my it. gosh, please. Yeah, I can tell you all about it. I can tell you exactly what to do, where to go, where to stay, and hook you up with an amazing family. And we, I, I could, if I start, I'm going to go for an hour. So we'll just <laughs> okay. do that another time. Deal. How old would you be if you didn't actually know how old you were? 45. I like that. If you were on your deathbed, what would you most regret not having done? I think I will have regretted if I don't mentoring a lot more people. Oh, that is in your DNA, isn't it? Yeah. I love that. Okay. So answer, this is the rapid fire round. Answer as quickly or as slowly as you'd like. It's basically a first thing that comes to mind round. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Connecting people. What's one of the things you're afraid of right now? Fucking up publicly. (laughs) (laughs) That is going to be my poll quote for you, my dear. That's really good. What do people never ask you, but you wish they did? How I'm really feeling. What's the one thing that you want to get better at? Ooh, waking up earlier. (laughs) What audiobook have you re-listened to the most? I don't listen to audiobooks. Mm, I was, was, for some reason or another, I thought you were going to say that. (laughs) So we're going to redefine that question. What book have you reread the most? The Four Agreements over and over and over again. Yeah. Yep. Be impeccable with your word. I love it. What is the one thing that you own and probably should throw out, but never will? My middle school photography portfolio. (laughs) Okay. I have to ask that. Why? It's when I learned about black and white film photography and fell in love with it. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Last question. If you had to give a TED talk on nothing that you're known for, nothing that you speak about, and it could be on anything you like or anything you have a passion for, or frankly, anything else at all, what would it be? It would either be on curiosity or on dill pickles. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to ask why dill pickles? I've been obsessed with Claus and dill pickles since I was a child to the point where my parents had to ration my intake of them. <laughs> 
That is so funny. Only because I just saw a shake, like a protein shake that was dill pickle. And I was like, who in the world would ever drink a protein yeah, shake? Frankly, dill pickle? I wouldn't even do that. I just like them in their natural okay, well, good. state. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Yeah. I mean, I, my ask is really an invitation that right now I am creating a three-day fully virtual, so all online, completely free summit called Life by Design, Not by Default, which hilariously is something I think you also say almost verbatim. And it has 45 plus speakers and 20 hours of content, everyone from Deepak Chopra to Adam Grant and Jen Sincero and many, many other gifted folks taking people day one through how do you intentionally design your life and break free of other people's definitions of success. Day two, how do you fund that through your career or business and make sure it integrates into the vision you've created? And then day three, how do you create the community and the network to support you and your dreams? So I invite everyone to check that out and participate as you so choose as it's absolutely free and completely online. Amazing. We'll link that up in the show notes. Well, I cannot thank you enough. I know that we will, I'm sure, since we're in the same city, be meeting in person soon and getting to know each other better. So I'm so glad that uh, I'm not even quite sure how we connected. I don't know how we connected, but I'm glad we're here. The universe. Thank you so much. Yeah, the universe. Thank you so much for this interview. This was awesome. Thank you, Rob. It's been such a pleasure. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live.